Welcome to Bullshift the Podcast, the podcast where we talk about how the financial services industry shifts your attention to make you feel more bullish. My name is John DeGuy. I'm the host of the podcast and the author of the book, Bullshift. My guest this week is Jasmine Fan. She is a director and senior member of the iShares Investment Management Team. And in her role, she works with both institutional and wealth clients throughout North and South America by helping them with macro insights and actionable ETF solutions. Jasmine graduated from Columbia University with a degree in applied mathematics and economics, and she is also a CFA charter holder. Jasmine, welcome. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm wondering if you could take a moment to talk to the people watching and listening uh, about what your day looks like. What do you do as part of your job? Uh, tell, walk me through a typical day or week uh, uh, in your life. Yeah, I want to say I probably spend 50% of my time on, on research, uh, you know, paying attention to key market drivers, what's happening and, you know, um, to really form our investment views and um, so that we can present that to our clients. And my other 50% of my time is really spent uh, talking to clients. Um, you know, you mentioned I cover South America and North America, which includes Canada. Um, I'm actually going to Peru and Columbia next week to talk to a lot of the investment managers there to share our investment views and also implementation ideas. So that's kind of my day to day or, you know, my week to week uh, at BlackRock. Lots of uh, lots of air miles. <laughs> lots of time on it. OK, so uh, let's talk then about how your how your outlook for 2024 is shaping up. I don't usually do a lot of forecasting, but I figured it's the beginning of 2024. I should at least have one guest who uh, who would uh, offer their thoughts as to how they see the micro, uh, the macro environment evolving. And I thought, well, who better than someone from BlackRock? Given BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager, manager, you'd have a, a lot of things to think about and a lot of thoughts. So, how would you say you see 2024 shaping up right now? Yeah, that's um, an awesome way to start the conversation. And at BlackRock, we actually usually start the year by laying out the three key investment themes, as those tend to be the key drivers of the market going forward. So I want to quickly share with you uh, what are those for 2024. The first is around man managing macro risk. Uh, when we think about the regime we sit in, we don't want to just focus on soft landing outcomes or late cycle dynamics. What we recommend is that we're experiencing the normalization from the pandemic. So I would call 2024 the year of normalization, meaning lower inflation, lower interest rates, um, but we're still really being influenced by structural drivers such as shrinking working force, um, geopolitical tensions, and also the growing debt issues in the US. And that could translate to uh, periods of volatility. But that that is um, something we are looking forward to because that also creates opportunities and dispersion in the market. Um, so 2024 is unlikely to be a repeat of 2023, where we saw that concentrated in the rally in the market. We would expect broadening out of the equity market performance. And the second theme is related, right? As the Fed is moving away from the rate hiking cycle to a rate cutting cycle, we would see more opportunities and dispersions of returns. So our second theme is actually called steering portfolio outcomes. Um, so the combination of moderation in inflation and still pretty good growth, pretty resilient growth, means that investors want to be selective and nimble when it comes to investing. And this can be selectivity within sectors, factors, and also regions and countries. And the last theme I want to mention is that, you know, one way to drive portfolio outcome is by looking at some of the longer term drivers. Um, and that's what we call mega forces. And, you know, we have seen AI and, you know, robotics disrupted the world of technology in 2023, but there are more of those longer terms that can drive the market in 2024. So having exposures to those long-term themes is another key important theme and an important building blocks in our portfolios and in, in clients' portfolios that we want to consider in 2024. 
Okay, well, I'm going to see if I can come back to two or three of those themes as we do the interview. But for the for the time being, I want to now, uh, as, as you uh, will know, a lot of what I talk about in Bullshift is optimism bias and the way people uh, have an optimistic viewpoint uh, to the point where it could actually harm them by not being careful about what to expect. In August of 2022, Chairman Powell was talking about their, how there will be pain and and how we were going to be raising rates and 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 how the rate cuts would be coming not until much later and you know later in 2024 is when they're being expected now but in 2022 uh, the context was still one of it's going to be higher for longer and that didn't really that didn't really happen and it, well it, it, the pain didn't really happen the, the the rate hikes came and they continued uh but now what would you say are the key indicators that the fed is looking at because um disposable income and and uh borrowing and savings and other things that that uh are are part of the concern um they they haven't really played out exactly the way people expected them to uh, and that's not necessarily bad because in many ways the news is better what do you see um, going forward for 2024? Yeah, first of all, I just want to say that dovish, dovish shift we saw in December from the Fed was real, right? Uh, the market had really turned from looking at how high policy rates can be uh, as a narrative for 2023 to how many cuts are we getting in 2024 and when are we going to get that first cut? That is becoming the narrative in 2024. And I love how you mentioned, uh, you know, um, behavior behavior bias and optimistic bias. Uh, that's what we're seeing in the market right now as people are pricing in six cuts uh, to happen in 2024, right? I have to say that number came down to five and a half cuts uh, just um, this week because of the strong data points we, we got last week and also the strong inflation point we got um, today. So when it comes to key indicators and what the Fed is looking at, I I would say inflation is still top of mind. Um, the reason Fed made the dovish pivot in December is not really they have declared victory against the inflation. We all know it is very difficult to get inflation from 4% to 2%. It was much easier to get inflation from 8% down to 4%. Um, the inflation data we got this morning was a great example, right? We are still looking at a year over year inflation of 3.4%, um, also showing, uh, you know, continued stickiness in housing related items. And that's far away from that 2% target. But what the Fed is really focusing on at the moment is the trend in inflation. So if we look at the three months average and the six months average um, of inflation points, we are seeing moderation where we're seeing that, um, you know, inflation is coming down. And that's why the Fed is looking to cut um, to keep rates less restrictive, right? Because of the lagging impact of policy rates. Um, and the other key data point we will we'll be looking at and the Fed will be paying close attention to is labor market. Uh, we expect to see slowdown in the labor market, but there, if there is massive declines in the job numbers pointing to a sudden disruption in the jobs market, you know, sudden um, issues in the economy, that's when the Fed has to cut rates more aggressively. And, you know, you mentioned some of the data points um, like saving, um, you know, like consumption, we are starting to see slowdown in those data points. Um, but what we want to see is a healthy slowdown pointing to no sudden recession, no sudden, you know, falling out of the cliff kind of data. And, you know, going back to that uh, op optimistic bias, um, I, I think the way the market is pricing in the number of cuts is not necessarily just a reflection of how optimistic they are. Um, actually, the market always wants to price in more cuts than 
uh, reality because the possibility of an extreme bearish scenario, right? In that extreme bearish scenario um, that I just talked about, jobs market um, really all of a sudden going going through some terrible, um, you know, event. Um, then that's when the Fed wants to cut more than six times more aggressively, and that's being priced in by the market. Um, but you know, if you look at the price action in December, you're just like everyone's so happy, so optimistic about the market. I, I, I want to talk to you about what uh, the BlackRock viewpoint is with regard to a soft landing and a recession in a moment. But I wanted to, before I leave this uh, comment about whether we're going to have a few uh, cuts or more than a few, uh, the thing that always strikes me is that I, I'm hearing two narratives being conflated, in my opinion. I'm hearing a lot of people saying central bankers are talking about only two or three cuts. The market will talk about five or six, but the bankers will only talk about two or three. Uh, but but a lot of people will say we're going to be getting a soft landing uh, despite only the two or three cuts. And from my world, from my perspective, two or three cuts means it's going to be a soft landing because inflation is slowly being brought down and employment is maintained. And as you say, if we have five or six cuts or more, it's because it's a hard landing and the economy is in trouble and people are out of work and the, the, the multiple cuts are needed in order to, to keep things moving. Now, I can buy either narrative. The problem that I'm seeing is the industry tends to conflate the two, and they seem to suggest that we can have only two, uh, we can have five or six cuts and still not have inflation and still not have job losses and everything is Goldilocks. And so my concern is one of, look, I, I can buy the story of two or three cuts and a soft landing. I can buy the story of five or six or seven cuts, and that's because the economy is in trouble. But Two or three cuts and the economy keeps on rocking and rolling and, and and inflation is brought under control and there are no job losses. I find that narrative hard to believe. And, and in fact, actually more like five or six cuts and everything keeps on going. I find that hard to believe. And I'm just wondering if the people at BlackRock think about how the industry has a narrative that that might not be entirely consistent. As I say, I can I can buy either or. But what I'm what I'm hearing from much of the industry is a bit of a best of both worlds, and I and I find that a bit suspect. Yeah, honestly, I agree with you completely on some of the confusion people are having. You know, when people are talking about oh, more cuts, optimistic, right? And uh, in reality, if we have more cuts, that is a bearish scenario. So I think people are not differentiating the good cuts and the bad cuts, right? The good cut is when inflation is actually coming down, the economy is actually doing okay. The Fed is like, we don't need to keep rates restrictive. Uh, let's cut versus the bad cut uh, that we talked about. Um, so at BlackRock, you know, how we think about the number of cuts is that we do not think we're going to get six because we do not see that, you know, severe recession situation to play out in 2024. Um, so four, uh, four cuts is probably more realistic. Um, and also, I think, you know, the issue I'm having with the market pricing at the moment is when is the first cut? The market is pricing a full cut in March. That is just too early for the for the Fed um, based on the inflation prints we're, we're seeing, um, based on the other evidence from the, you know, um, Fed officials. Um, you know, we do think the first cut is probably going to happen uh, later in the year, probably around May time period. Um, so that is, you know, how our consensus view is different from the current market pricing. Okay. So I think I heard you say probably about four cuts starting probably around May. All right. So let's uh, flesh this out a bit now. What, what would you say BlackRock's view is with regard to the probability of a recession? What is, what is, what is BlackRock's view and, and how does it maybe differ from the views that you might be hearing from other uh, thought leaders? Of course. Uh, first of all, I just want to say um, for a very long time or um, since 2023, our view has been that, um, you know, we are going to see a mild recession uh, in the economy, but not a severe recession. Um, obviously, that didn't play out as expected, meaning, you know, we didn't see that official recession happening in 2023, but we did see, um, you know, evidence of recession or recessionary 
industry type of uh, events happening in certain sectors and industries. Um, for example, we kept a, a recession monitor since 2022, uh, showing different parts, <clears throat> the key indicators for different parts of the economy. And what had happened is that, um, you know, the investment uh, type of uh, sectors and also industrial production sectors have been showing recessionary data, whereas the labor market is very, very strong and related U.S. consumers have been very, very strong, right? Um, so combining all the data, we never had that official recession in 2023. Um, and even in the third quarter of 2023, we saw a GDP growth of 4.9%, which is above trend in the U.S. And I always joke about how that is uh, entirely a result of Taylor Swift and Beyonce concert in, in Q3 2023. Um, but, you know, set the jokes aside, I think um, what happened is that, you know, we are seeing multiple cycles happening at the same time and, you know, strengths in certain sectors really offsetting the others. But if we look at earnings, we did see earnings recession in 2023 with three quarters of negative uh, earnings growth in SP500 companies. So going into 2024, we actually expect recovery to happen in a lot of those sectors, including company earnings. We're seeing positive year-over-year -year earnings growth again in SP500. Um, and also some of the um, sectors that saw uh, industrial you know, slowdown, saw uh, investment slowdown is actually coming to recover, whereas jobs market is going to experience further slowdown. Um, you know, the consumption data is probably continue going to see uh, you know, further decline. So combine all those different sectors again, we are probably not going to see recession um, or official recession um, data in 2024. What we're going to see is probably a slowdown in the economy, but still pretty resilient growth and positive growth going into the year. So let's talk about the way the terminology and, and the lexicon and the narrative of the forecasts has been morphing. Uh, when you uh, when you use the word soft landing or the term soft landing now, what do you mean? When you use the word hard landing, what do you mean? When you use the word recession, what do you mean? Because uh, depending on who you talk to, they will say, oh, well, it, it, it's a technical recession because we've had two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction, but because of this and this and this, it's not really a recession. So I'm wondering if you could maybe be as explicit as you can about how, how you would keep score. Yeah, I love this question just because uh, the definition of those terms have changed a lot and people have been using those uh, interchangeably. First of all, I want to say there is a difference between soft landing versus hard landing and also no landing. <laughs> no landing meaning there is no slowdown in the economy. Um, you know, the, the growth just takes off from here, whereas both soft landing and hard landing are pointing to major slowdown in the economy. It just that hard landing is closer to the concept of a recession. Uh, and when I said recession earlier, you know, thinking about the monitor we had, uh, we really need all the sectors uh, or all the key indicators to fall into the inflation, sorry, the recessionary uh, territory in order to call it a recession. If we only see, um, you know, terrible production data, terrible investment data, but uh, an unemployment rate of 3.7 percent uh, still you know one of the lowest in you know five decades we just cannot call that a recession no matter uh, what the GDP number is giving us right so um, I think recession and hard landing is a little bit uh, narrowly defined whereas the market is really talking about uh, soft landing and no landing uh, in a very confusing way and uh, when a lot of people think about soft landing I think what they uh, really meant is is no lending, uh, you know, no recession, no slowdown in the economy. Um, but that's just not uh, the real definition of soft lending. All right. So then maybe maybe we can try it this way. What if we assign probabilities? If you if you were to have three three different buckets and it totals to a hundred, uh, what percent would you say is soft landing? What would you what percent would you say is hard landing? And what would, what percent would you say is no landing at all? And we just keep on rocking and rolling. 
Yeah, I, I want to just give some rough numbers, and there's no models or you know scientific approach behind this. Um, I'll give hard landing a very small probability, and um, probably under ten percent, and I will give soft landing the highest probability. Um, you know, slow down in the economy, but not to major declines, and I think that can be um, somewhere between sixty uh, percent to seventy percent, and then the you know the 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 rest of it, you know, roughly 20% um, is going to be no landing, meaning that, you know, we don't even see a slowdown in 2024. We just see the economy taking off from here. Okay. So uh, maybe rough numbers, about two thirds probability of a soft landing, maybe a one ninth probability of a, uh, of a hard landing and about a one sixth probability of a best case scenario where there's no landing whatsoever. Do you think that sort of, um, uh, as as is mo as is usually the case, the most likely outcome is the one in the middle because people don't want to take extreme views, and and so what you're hearing is what you're saying is not surprising to me. I'm wondering if you could speculate or or give me a sense of the people that you speak with, um, the other advisors that work with BlackRock, any retail investors you work with, even institutional investors. Um, are their views more or less consistent with what you just explained in terms of the most likely being a soft landing and a very small probability of a hard landing and a, a, a healthy but not super large probability of a no landing whatsoever? Uh, are, are they consistent or are they well calibrated or the expectations appropriate? Because the concern that I have is that a lot of people uh, will take that and skew it to the right and be a little more optimistic so that the so that I think typical investors, for instance, I would say, uh, have vir they're ascribing virtually no probability whatsoever to a hard landing. And there might be, um, say, a 60 percent probability of a of a um, of a soft landing and a 35 percent probability of no landing whatsoever. We're just going to keep on going. That's my perception I, that you may not share it, but that's the impression I get. I'm wondering what your impression is. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, I talked to a not large number of clients, um, you know, across wealth, institutional and retail. Um, I think just, you know, uh, looking at some of the shift I saw in 2023, um, you know, that community, that investor community uh, certainly have turned more uh, positive, uh, you know, more optimistic about the economy. And that is based on real data points, uh, real market behavior behavior and, and company um, outlook guidance. Um, but I think what's interesting is, and, and going back to some of the behavior bias, is that you know when people say they're optimistic and uh, when people say they're um, you know, negative, um, you know, that's not necessarily how they're investing, right? The position um, across those investors might be very different from what they're telling others. Um, and you know, when you're just talking to people and hearing um, about the conversations, I think you tend to see a, a lot of consensus views. Whereas if you look at position across different investor communities, then that's when you see some of the uh, kind of more unique dispersion. Um, so we at BlackRock pay close attention to flows and, and positioning in the market. Um, and you know, I'm still seeing a large number of cash sitting on the sideline, meaning that you know, people are turning more optimistic, but not necessarily uh, wanting to put all the cash to work at this point, given uh, the level of equity valuation of, uh, you know, fixed income valuation. So I think, you know, people can be optimistic, but it might not be uh, truly reflected in their positions in, in their portfolios just yet. Okay, that's fair. Now, Earlier this year, uh, this being January of 2024, uh, you and your colleagues at BlackRock released your 2024 ETF implementation guide. And it mentions higher conviction investment opportunities. And although I don't like to talk about that very much, I wanna give you a moment to maybe spend two or three minutes talking about what you see those opportunities as being for those people who have cash in the sidelines who might want to deploy them 
what do you where do you see opportunities that are unique to the to the circumstances today yeah, of course. I want to first just comment on the cash position, right? I was saying that because not only we're seeing a record amount of money sitting on uh, sitting in cash, uh, we're seeing eight point three trillion dollars globally in money market and you know cash like um, assets, um, but also you know the pause period, meaning uh, between the last uh, rate hike and then the first rate cut, is actually where we tend to see the best performance in the market best equity and fixed income returns, um, you know, uh, outperforming cash by a large percentage, which means um, a lot of people are missing out on this, on the potential outperformance given um, the over allocation in cash. So, you know, a big theme on top of all everything I just talked about is really thinking about putting cash to work into different parts of the market. Um, so I want to talk about opportunities we see in fixed income and equity equities. Um, first of all, I think fixed income is uh, really a no brainer, right? Uh, now the Fed is not talking about hiking anymore. They're talking about cutting. Um, that means duration is going to be our friends again. Adding fixed income is going to be our friends again, unlike what ha uh, happened in 2023. Um, but we really like the middle of the curve, the belly of the curve, right? You want to have duration, so you don't want to stay um, in the front of the curve. You want to add, um, you know, lens to fixed income assets uh, from a carry and also downside protection perspective. But also we don't want to uh, recommend the longer end of the curve necessarily because, um, you know, that the longer end of the curve is more sensitive to uh, that supply, um, you know, um, all the other issues, uh, not necessarily as sensitive to policy changes. So the belly of the curve is where we see best opportunities and the sweet spot. Um, other than, you, you know, a sense when you say the belly, uh, are we talking about yeah, maybe 10 years? Like, well, how, far, how far along the curve are we talking? Yeah, about? We're, we're actually looking at three to seven year as kind of the rough range. Um, and then, you know, besides kind of playing along the, the yield curve, um, we're, we're also seeing opportunities in high quality fixed income. For example, uh, mortgages, uh, for example, emerging markets, market bonds because all the EM central banks have already started started cutting rates, right? So they're ahead of the, the Fed uh, in this current cycle. Um, and then moving on to equities, I think that is where things get more interesting and more tricky. Um, after that amazing rally we saw in 2023, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we do um, see potentially higher volatility this year because globally, we have 40 elections um, uh, around uh, the world um, and representing 40% of uh, the global pop population and more than 60% of uh, global GDP. So, you know, we are going to see a lot of event risk in 2024. But because, um, you know, we still see some resilience in, in growth and inflation moderating from 2023, that can still point us to positive equity returns. Um, but again, we want to be selective in this market. Um, we continue to like quality as our favorite factor in this economy. Uh, when I say quality, what I meant is company with high, uh, you know, uh, cash free yield, um, you know, low leverage ratio, those companies would continue to work well in 2024. But we want to barbell it with um, uh, exposures that underperformed in 2023. As I mentioned, um, you know, 2024 is probably not going to be a repeat of 2023. We're not going to see that concentration in rally anymore. Um, so we want exposures to help us play out that broadening of the equity market. Um, so we really like sectors that are, uh, you know, strong in fundamentals, but underperformed in 2023, such as financials, such as healthcare, and even small caps can be a way to play that, um, you know, broadening out of the economy. Um, so we like that barbell approach with, you know, high quality, large cap growth on one side and then small caps and more value oriented exposures on the other side. Okay. So let's, let's go quickly now to something that you've touched on already. 
which is uh, AI and the mega forces that are at play as we head into the new year and the world is changing. What do you see as being the role of the mega forces in 2024? Maybe you can take a few moments to explain what they are so that everyone's on the same page as well. Yeah, um, obviously, uh, mega force is how we call it at BlackRock, and there might be many other terminology for the same concept. Um, but I think the um, idea is very uh, intuitive and, and simple, right? In 2023, we have already seen the power of generative AI and ChatGPT, and also GLP-1 drugs, right? Things like those are going to um, change the the world, or you. Know, know, make lasting impact on uh, investment landscape for the years to come. And that is something we want to uh, make sure we get exposure to. And also as a long term allocation in our portfolios, not something we want to, um, you know, sell and buy and, and sell in, in three months. Um, so at BlackRock, we have identified several trends um, uh, as what we call mega forces or, you know, uh, thematic trends. Uh, that would benefit investors from a longer term perspective. For example, technology, right? Uh, the way to play AI, the best idea we have is actually still semiconductors. Um, you know, the rapid adoption of AI and growing use cases of AI just means more demand for semiconductors and, uh, you know, um, even more growth for those semiconductor industries. Um, and also, you know, besides technology and health care innovations, um, we think there is still a lot going on, on the in, in the international um, world as well, right? So one important theme or trend we have identified earlier and that really played out in 2023 is the separation of China from the rest of emerging markets. We saw more clients getting exposures to emerging markets as China, uh, you know, really want to manage China uh, as a standalone or reduce China exposures given the long-term structural challenges the Chinese economy is experiencing at the moment. And that brought investors more attention to places like India, uh, like Japan, like Mexico, where you know fundamental structural benefits are um, actually happening because of demographic um, issues, because of uh, you know reshoring trends. And that's something we um, are happy to help clients navigating as a longer term strategy in our portfolios. Great. This has been really different. Most of my interviews uh, for, for Bullshift, the podcast, are more uh, talking about behavioral economics and how it applies. And this is more one of investing. And uh, I think it's good to have a few of those too. So we have to wrap it up now, I'm afraid, Jasmine. So I always like to wrap up with, uh, with two sections. And the first is that's Bullshift which is when I ask my guests to talk about something that, that bugs them about the financial services industry, what would you say is something that's, that, that the industry could be doing different and, and by different, I mean better. I want to uh, take it back and uh, you know bring more to the behavioral science uh, part of it, uh, right? I think something I mentioned earlier is just that um, I think investors have a bias in that uh, they believe in consensus or you know something um, they, they they trust and then they do not tend to change uh, their positions or views on um, their investment allocations. Whereas uh, what had happened in the past uh, couple of years taught us as an investor, we need to be very nimble. We need to look at uh, those quick rotations and shifts in the market and um, and actually make actions, right? Unless you just want to uh, invest in SP 500 and put your money there together. Um, if you want to be an active investor, you want to pay attention to uh, those fast changing trends. Uh, and when I say active investor, I didn't mean, uh, you know, you need to be a stock picker. Um, you know, in the world of iShares, how we're helping clients have been um, helping them to choose the right ETF and to do the right rotation in an ETF portfolios. Um, but I think one thing to uh, change is just, you know, helping clients to be a bit more quick when it comes to uh, major regime shifts in the market. And that uh, could happen uh, a lot of times again in 2024 as well. 
Great. So I heard you use the word shift. You said regime shifts. So the second thing that I add, that I always ask my guests about is something I call shift happens. If you could find a way to help people shift their their uh, their 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 thinking in terms of the way uh, circumstances change, how would you go about doing that? What would you recommend? Yeah, so um, again, as part of iShares, what I want to uh, recommend is really using ETF or some type of broad exposures to do those uh, shifts, uh, to get access to the shifts. Um, one example is just, uh, you know, during SVB crisis, after the regional banking crisis, we saw a very quick shift uh, in, from investors in terms of, you know, uh, rotating all the uh, value exposures back into growth. Um, and um, it is quite difficult to choose the right companies to do that, right? Uh, finding the right moment to trade in those companies. But it is a little bit easier if you can use a factor ETF or sector ETF to do that, right? Um, you just have to uh, change your broader allocation to um, an, an exposure and, you know, really removing a lot of the companies specific risk by uh, having that diversification in an ETF uh, vehicle. Um, so that is something I would recommend and, and just something to think about uh, when it comes to being nimble and selective in this market. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jasmine. It's been a real pleasure having you on. I want to wish you all the best for 2024 and beyond. Really pleasure joining. Thank you for having me. John DeGuey is a portfolio manager in Toronto and the author of the book Bullshift, How Optimism Bias Threatens Your Finances. Bullshift is available online and in bookstores everywhere. The opinions expressed in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Bullshift, the podcast, is produced by TalkShoe, a division of IOTUM.